This is a historic photo. The brethren of Kyiv Pichersklovra decided to take it to commemorate the 30th anniversary of monasticism reinstitution at the monastery. In the summer of 1988, after the long years of a silent prayer, monks returned to Lavra. Shoulder to shoulder are those who joined Rus' principal sanctuary decades ago and those who just recently took the monastic vows. All of them are the successors of a thousand-year-old monastic tradition who left the world behind for the sake of a continuous prayer for it. The 92-year-old Father Avrami is the oldest monk of Kiev Pichersk Lavra. For many years, he has lived his life in seclusion. Today, the elder has walked out of his cell to join the brethren at taking a picture. The blessing, it is something that anything you do at the monastery starts with. Even Lavra monks regard Father Avrami's blessing as a grace, while for ordinary worshippers, meeting with the elder is next to a miracle. Everything you're going to see was shot under the blessing of the elder, of the Father Superior and the Brethren of Kivpichersk Lavra. Many of these things are customarily not visible to strange eyes and include unique episodes from the monastery's life. The monastic vows, the Brethren meals, the works of penance, who will walk you down the secret corridors of Lavra caves where no pilgrim's foot has stepped in decades. It is the world's only shrine being home to relics of 120 saints having dwelt here centuries ago whose bodies miraculously escaped corruption. This is a shrine where the entire history of monkhood in Rus started a thousand years ago. Archimandrite Polycarp knows each brick and each path in Lavra. He joined the monastery 30 years ago when the authorities decided to reopen it after long years of decay and destruction. It was June 16, 1988, when the thousandth anniversary of baptizing Rus was being celebrated. Right here, the holy table was placed and bishops were standing. The divine liturgy was served. It was the year 1988. A historic decision was made at the state level to organize the celebration of the thousandth anniversary of baptizing Rus. The authorities loosened their pressure on the church and senior public servants held a series of meetings with the top representatives of the clergy. A rumor that soon Kiev Pichers Klobra would be reopened was being actively spread in Kiev. The celebration can be compared with a feeling of someone who had been kept in prison for years, chained and handcuffed, and then he was suddenly unchained, untied and let free. It was an enormous spiritual joy, an emotional rise when we started being reconnected with. Many sacred things were returned to us, of which the greatest one was Lavra itself. Yes, this is the excitement no words can describe. Thirty years ago, this place housed about 150 enterprises of all sorts. Building 34, hosted the Embassy of Italy and a tobacco company's office. The Church of a Consolation of All Sorrows used to be a goldsmith's shop, whereas the Church of Anna's Conception had been rearranged to operate as a movie theater. The monastery's holiest spot, the Assumption Cathedral, was in ruins, 
It had been demolished during World War II. The roof of the refectory temple was abundantly overrun with trees and bushes. Lots of their both buildings stood forsaken and decaying. Kiev believers, however, were happy to have those ruins returned to them for worshiping there. The first prayer on June 16, 1988, brought together just a few thousand worshipers. Later, the state power authorities formally reassigned several buildings and temples of Kiev Pechersk Lavra into the ownership of the Orthodox Church. Four monks came back to the monastery, and a few novitiates joined them shortly. One of them was the would-be monk Polycarp, who at the time was just 17 years old. The young novitiate can be seen on this footage. Here he is by the wall. The brethren spent the whole summer of 1988 cleaning up the monastery territory, removing tons of garbage and debris, whitewashing walls, taking care of relics of saints, painting icons and restoring bit by bit remains of ancient notes. This is the best point to experience the contrast between what was here when we arrived and what the place has become now. There are pictures available. Building 49 only has bare walls, no doors, no windows and trees growing wildly inside. August of 1988 saw an extraordinary event occurring in the monastery, which really bewildered many scientists. Holy heads started to secrete myrrh in the far caves. One of them supposedly belongs to Clement of Rome, who was martyred in Chersonesus in the second century AD. Eventually, Saint Prince Vladimir delivered this sacred relic to Kiev. The other heads have not been attributed yet. Starting from the 14th century, these merse creating heads are transferred through generations. Unfortunately, they are not attributed, and we don't know what saints they belong to. But their belonging to saint relics is compellingly manifested in their mercy creating. They produce this very special kind of oil that we call myrrh. When the heads started to abundantly secrete myrrh, Monks would say, the Saint Fathers rejoice that the prayer is spoken in their boat. The 20th century became the time of the hardest challenges and trials for the monastery. At the dawn of the century, Kiev was referred to as the city of monks and warriors. Kiev Pichersk Lavra is a home for 500 monks and the same number of novitiates, plus another thousand of workers. The great church, that was the title that the prominent painter Vasily Vereshchagin gave to this canvas. Pilgrims kneel in front of the Assumption Cathedral. On holidays, the number of worshippers is so huge that they have to look for space in the square outside the temple territory. Just a few decades will elapse, and totally different events will start to unfold before the great church. Along with the whole country, the abode will go through wars, revolutions, and destruction. For the first time in many years, new martyrs sacrificing their lives for Christ will come about. Two things should be borne in mind. The God gives for us how he wishes, or he chastises us when we deserve this retribution. What happened to Lavra in early 20th century is exactly an act of the God's retribution for our sins. Unfortunately, it is true. Even though people tend to excuse themselves, and present themselves as martyrs, we in fact deserve this treatment and the Lord causes us to suffer. Lover is a holy place. When the Lord's will is to test or to punish a man, he will have no mercy for holy things either. The holy place is for a man, so we deserve this kind of a treatment by our sins. Early February of 1918, anarchy and revolutionary chaos reign in Kiev. Robberies, violence, murders, the Orthodox Church faces a real threat of the schism, which is selflessly confronted by the Metropolitan of Kiev and Galicia, Vladimir, sending endless prayers from the Assumption Cathedral. Yes, this is about a human nature. A man may not comprehend some phenomena with his mind, but in his soul he will feel 
that this is the way things have to happen. I can only guess that he perhaps was passing a fidelity test, and he passed this test successfully. He made a decision for himself, whereby he chose to suffer with the God over obtaining freedom without the Creator. In the evening of February 7, five men in military uniforms entered the quarters of the Metropolitan of Kiev and Galicia, Vladimir. They walked him to the square in front of the Assumption Cathedral and led him through the gates of All Saints all the way towards these ramparts. Next morning, his body was found by the worshippers heading to Lavra for prayer. The Metropolitan was buried in the Church of Exaltation of the Holy Cross. Many decades later, in 1992, Lavra became home to the incorruptible relics of one of the first martyrs, suffering for Christ in the God-defined 20th century. There is a hill not far from Lavra, just across. They led him on top on this hill and went on preparing for firing. He prayed, gave his blessing to the firing squad, and then they shot him. And the hand that gave blessing to the slayers remained perfectly incorruptible. The relics of Metropolitan Vladimir were recovered on June 27, 1992, and ever since, they rest in Lovra's far caves. Monks often send prayers for the church unity to the saint. We are so happy that the Lord brought such a holy man to this world who showed us the way to follow in this challenging time. The hierarch suffered for being a son of the church. Those times were really hard. Some people stood up for autocephaly. Others wanted autonomy, not concord at all. He, however, was guarding the church within its canonic confines. For it does not really matter for the church what freedom status it has. What matters is that it be within canonic confines, with Christ's confines. And he managed to preserve church under Christ's custody, and he suffered from that. This is yet another proof of the right choice for us, the right path we choose to follow. In the same February of 1918, the church was officially severed from the state, and religious organizations were deprived of their assets. Massive seizure of clerical values began. In 1926, a museum complex started to get organized. 1931 saw the ultimate ousting of monks from Lavra, while some of them were shot dead. A unique collection of icons, books and garments was moved to the central bank. Everything was being moved out. The icons of the Church of Exaltation of the Holy Cross and the Church of Nativity of the Holy Mother of God, as well as some sacraria are now in England. I saw some of the ancient icons in Jerusalem and we brought them back with the help of good people. A museum of anti-religious propaganda was set up in Lavra in the 30s. Atheist placards and posters were scattered all over the place. The relics of the saints would be unveiled and displayed to the church visitors in the most insulting fashion. The holiness of martyrs stayed unshaken. They never left Lavro. Even though people were ousted from the monastery, the real saints did not let it happen to them. A real paradox. It was incomprehensible, hard to believe, that an atheistic state kept saying the holy martyrs that rebuked and condemned the authorities' wrongfulness. Nevertheless, authorities did keep those relics in and organized tours to show them to visitors. People would listen to the explanations but made their own judgments. No matter what, the saints never abandoned this place. Nazi invaders enter Kiev in September 1941 and start plundering Lavra. On direction of Reich Commissioner Eric Koch, the silver altar, the royal gates and icon plating, preciously cladded gospels get massively moved out of the monastery. The icon of Assumption of the Holy Mother of God, dating back to the 11th century and donated by Greek masters who were erecting the temple, vanishes without a trace. On November 3, the whole city was shaking with a terrible explosion. The Church of Assumption is blown up.
During the occupation years, however, the monastery was active. The Nazi allowed monks to return. German occupants had no plans to nourish religion in the seized lands. They just pretended to be nice to believers, hoping that the church, suppressed by the God-defined Soviet power, will become their ally. Germans had to show they were different from the Soviets. That's why they declared that the George was allowed. Notwithstanding the Nazis' plans, the church never became a supporter of their regime. Monks returning to their cells did not serve the invaders. Their service was devoted to God and the people. Over the two years of Kiev occupation, the Nazi annihilated dozens of clergymen in Kiev. After the city liberation, the monastery life in Lavra went on and lasted up until 1961. Father Avrami is 92 years old and he took the monastic vows in mid-50s. I arrived in 1953 on the day of St. Theodosius of the caves to see some of the old monks who had served sentences in prisons. The most prominent of them was Kukshaw, the most famous one. After the war, a flow of worshippers seeking a meeting with monks would never stop. All this came to an end when Khrushchev repressions against the church broke out in 1961. On Easter, thousands of worshippers were standing on the all-night vigil in the Church of Exaltation of the Holy Cross. Hard to imagine how many people gathered here, and a concern that something had to be done about it started to grow, the concern that the Church had been afforded too much freedom. A new round of persecution against the Church rises up. New repressions begin. They started to make up false criminal cases, for instance, an attack that a monk allegedly committed against a communist newspaper reporter. Finally, the monastery was closed in 1961. I was taken to the police station. All those questions like, where were you? Where did you live? Your ID? Then they gave me three days to vacate the place. I reported to Father Superior. What could we do? It's a power authority. Since then, the prayer silenced for the long 27 years to follow. In mid-11th century, a man returned to Kiev from the holy mountain of Athos, a man blessed with the fate to become the founder of the entire Russian monkhood. Reverend Antonius acquired quiet time in Pechersk hills. For many centuries, this land used to be hunting grounds for Kiev princes. A word about the anchorage spread all over Kiev in no time. People started to come to Antonius some of them seeking blessing and a prayer, others looking to become monks. A few years later, the brethren counted 12 hermits, including Reverend Theodosius, who was eventually voted the monastery's hegumen. This is how the first monks abode, Kiev Pichersk Lavra, emerged in Rus in the 11th century. Saint Antonius and then Saint Theodosius were the founders and promoters of monkhood in Lavra. They were the ones who transferred the Athos monastic traditions to the Rus soil. It is hard to see how the monk movement would have evolved if it weren't for these two zealots. But in addition to monkhood traditions, they also promoted other atheist traditions, including liturgy and cultural ones. By saying cultural traditions, I mean the external expression of religiousness, that is the garments code, service rights, and so on. Thus, seeking to transplant purely external elements, they also inculcated the very spirit of atheists, or should I say, the whole system of monastic values. They established the whole philosophy of Russian monks' lifestyle based on the experience of the holy mountain of Athos. All the things that occurred throughout the history of monks and Rus stem from Kiev Pechersk Lavra. It has always been an example, a flagship, an orienter of the monastic way of life. In this regard, its significance cannot be overestimated. 
as it continues to do a perfect job in promoting the great traditions that were enrooted by St. Antonius and St. Theodosius. In the context of all the challenges of modern times, the monastery is exercising its daring mission in the most wise and righteous manner for the benefit of the Russian Orthodox faith. The place where St. Antonia settled down is now referred to as Far Caves. The total length of the tunnels is 300 meters at the depth from 15 to 30 meters. Three ancient churches are based here, the Church of Annunciation of Our Lady, the Church of Nativity of Christ and the St. Theodosius Church. These caves also house the relics of 47 venerable monks who had lived, worked and prayed here. The cell that used to be home to St. Theodosius has also survived till now. In the 17th century, it was enlarged. Until then, it was of more modest dimensions. In these conditions, our Holy Fathers spent the whole of their lives. They slept on a rock. Their robes served as both a pillow and a blanket. At times of the Great Land, Theodosius would lock himself in his cell for 40 days and the entrance would be covered with soil. He only had some bread with him. The Breton only ate bread and vegetation, while some of them ate once a day. Some of monks even had one meal in three days. Each one chose the severity of the endeavor individually. The fraternity was growing, and so did the monastery, going way beyond its original delimitations. Monks were constructing temples and cells, only hermits remained in caves. The catacombs turned into monks' burial site. As per the atheist tradition, the remains of monks whose souls transgressed to a better world were draped in mantles and left in special niches inside the caves. Throughout the entire history of the abode, 120 holy fathers found their eternal rest in the near and far caves. The word reverend implies that the person is revered as being closer to the God than anyone else. The reverend ones committed all their lives, their ascetic efforts, their selfless suppression of passions, sins, and even sinful thoughts to achieve the level of holiness that made them as spiritually close to the Lord as it was possible. The catacombs configuration dramatically changed in the 17th century when mass pilgrim movement to the monastery boomed. Looking to prevent from earth slides, Holy Hierarch Piotr Magilla instructed to expand the walls of ancient corridors and to veneer them with bricks, while the floor was cladded with iron plates. Only one underground corridor has survived in its original shape. At this point, we are approaching the so-called Varangian caves that have always fueled the inquisitiveness of historians, archaeologists and lay believers. The caves that have survived in their primevalness and in which our holy fathers, including St. Antonius, the monastery father-founder, started to establish the abode. For decades, no pilgrim's foot has stopped here. This place is intentionally kept unseen for a stranger's eyes. The Vrangian Caves emerged long before Cave Pichersk Lavra was founded. The legend has it that the caves used to be a hiding place to which outlaws brought their loot from robbed vessels traveling from Greece to Vrangian lands and backwards, which lent the name to the caves. Some historians suggest that it was a shelter for the first Christians of Kiev Rus as early as in the 6th, 7th centuries. Some of them argue that St. Antonius settled down in Varangian caves after he arrived in Kiev from the holy mountain of Athos. Later, in the 13th century, they offered an asylum to Kiev citizens during Mongol Tartar invasion. In some spots of Varangian caves, a lot of human remains were found, which sustains scientists' hypothesis whereby Kiev citizens sought asylum in here. Mind you, at that time the city of Kiev was pretty far away from the monastery. Ancient passages are relatively poorly explored. Their length is estimated to be some 200 meters. The subterranean humidity is quite high, while the temperature is around 14 degrees Celsius. For many centuries, everything here remains untouched. There is a very special place in the far caves 
that each and every pilgrim is committed to come to. It is where mercy-creating heads are placed since the 14th century. I will not get it out of its arc. You can see it from here. We endeavor to expose them to the minimum disturbance, as we have observed, that the lesser is the commotion, the more intensive is the mere secretion. Too bad the camera cannot fix this very special order they emit. In 1988, a medical expert commission started their probe into the incorruptible relics and the mere secreting heads. Economics sought to refute the miracle and to prove that myrrh, secreted by the heads, is of natural and chemically explicable origin. In simple terms, the idea was that monks add some oil into the vessels containing the heads. We found the outcomes of this research in the archives of Kiev Pichersk Reserve. This research proved that it was protein which is only specific of a life organism. Scientists were never able to answer the question about the origin of myrrh. If people knew what a monastery has in stock for them, they would all rush to a monastery. If, however, people knew about the consequences of a temptation and a retribution for a failure to withstand it, they all would have kept away from it. In 30 years that have elapsed after the monastery reinstitution, more than 400 novitiates took the monastic vows in here. You're about to see unique footage, the ritual of monastic vows. This is how a man leaves the secular life behind. The near caves. You cannot tell the time of the day nor the season when in here. The lover monks descend to the holy relics in a way the Father Superior to join. New monk robes are placed in a shrine with holy relics. Novitiates dressed in white shirts receive the last guidance and kneel before the Saint Antonius icon. There we took off our clothes attended before this great sacrament and prayed to St. Antonius, as well as to all the Holy Fathers of Pechersk, pleading for spiritual reinforcement on our monastic paths. Father Superior of Kiev Pechersk Lovra enters the altar. Lights in the caves go off, only candles and oil lamps remain lit. <laughs> The sacrament begins. Starting from the cell of the monastery founder, St. Antonius, three novitiates crawl towards the altar on their knees. The silhouettes in white garments are barely visible in the cave's twilight. At some point in my life, I finally understood that I'm going to embark upon a month's path. This was the idea that had matured inside me, as well as a desire to devote all of myself to serving the God. Father Superior reminds the gathering that Christ and Our Lady, joined by angels, are invisibly listening to the vows being spoken by the future monks. One of the principal pledges is to once and for all, do away with all of their wishes and to lovingly carry out the vows given by Father Superior and the Brethren. By the same token, monks commit themselves to the eternal celibate. Do you commit to remain in this monastery as part of your vow of obedience in fast and deprivation until you take your last breath? Be God, our Holy Father. It is hard to believe that these vows sound exactly where monkhood in Rus took its roots. It is on the floor of these dimly lit caves where the first cut hair of those who turned down secular lives fell down a thousand years ago. 
Let all of us say it. Lord, have mercy. Brother Yoniki is cutting his hair as a token of defying this world and all living in it, and in a commitment to reject his will and all of his carnal lusts. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let all of us say it, Lord, have mercy. It felt like all Holy Fathers are rejoicing and praying here with us, and that I, a sinner, am being made part of the chronicles of these devotees whose deeds made this place divine. Just one instant, and all the past is left behind. Ahead is a new life with a new name, which is announced to the monk at the time of his taking vows. In this abode, brethren are given names of holy fathers of Kivpichersk Lovra who founded this monastery. The names you have been given are not given by me. It was Our Lady who gave you these names, along with an opportunity to have the celestial guardians and to follow their suits as you enter your new life here. It was a great delight for me when Father Superior was accepting my vows and gave me the name of a great Saint Yoniki, the Metropolitan of Kiev and Galicia. The monks are making their way out of the caves into a snowy March evening. Now, they have three new brethren joining them. If there is no monkhood, the world will not survive. After all, what is it that sustains the world? It is the prayers, and genuine prayers originate in monk fraternity, because a person living in a secular life has no opportunity to pray. He lives in a perpetual fuss, while monks commit their lives to exactly this purpose, to pray at all times, to plead the Lord for peace across the world. Яко спаса родила і всі душ наших. Твій небесний утешителю души істини, і живі здеси і вся ісполняй, сокроща благих і житні подателю, приди і всі лися в неї очистені, і всякий скверний, спаси блажі душі. Since the beginning of time, monks in Lavra have always worked hard, growing vegetables and livestock, cooking meals, baking bread, keeping bees, painting icons and tailoring their garments. A thousand years after the monastery foundation, nothing has changed in here. Our Lady herself is our hegemonist and hostess here. She's the one who assigns kinds of obedience to brethren. Sometimes we don't even understand why, but it's only the providence that puts us where we are. Irrespective of the season, windows in this room get lit long before dawn. Work starts here as early as at 3 in the morning. Following an ancient recipe, monks prepare dough. All saints, pray for us to the Lord. The dough is made from the top quality wheat, yeast, water and salt. And our prayer accompanies its mixing. The brethren are preparing to bake prosperous, a special sort of bread used for the service. During a liturgy, large prosperous will become the body of Christ, while little ones will be distributed to the worshippers who will eat them with holy water before their morning meal. A monastery is like a beehive where everyone has a responsibility to attend to. Being late or wasting time for pointless chit-chat does not happen here. The obedience assignments are carried out quickly and responsibly. Therefore, the brethren can bake 8,000 prosperous as fast as within an hour. A prayer sounds in the bakery at all times. Its words are short and spoken aloud, taking turns. Add more wax. Did you turn it on? By the grace of God, I did. The monks are happy. They managed to turn on the machine, keeping a thread intact. In order to avoid any failures, a prayer for the Almighty's help in their endeavors sounds here continuously as well. 
We have two kinds of obedience here in Lavra. Bread baking and candle making. Bakery, however, is top priority, as it is there where holy bread is being baked. Though making candles is also a holy labor, and these two kinds of obedience have always been present in monasteries. Like centuries ago, candles in Lavra are only made from natural wax, pure, with no additives. We load wax in here, and here it melts. Then it melts, settles, and while on a water bath, candles are extracted. The process evolves from small to big. Here on the third part of the drum, the wax mask cools down and gets somewhat crystallized. When it gets to cotton, it is almost cold. Now candles are cut. And here is a ready stack of candles. All the baking in Lavra occurs here, and then bread is served for brethren meal. Dough prepared from natural products is mixed in a machine. All baked products are always lent. They never contain milk or eggs. The sourdough recipe is an ancient one found in monastery cookbooks. Sourdough is a yeast-free product. It is just flour and water without anything else. See how fluffy it is. Let me show you. This is how the products are tested. Father Pamva is a key man in the bakery. He holds ultimate responsibility for everything in here. Quality of products, cleanliness and training of new novitiates. Every day he rolls up his sleeves and stands by his brethren. We don't have specialists with grades or qualifications. We have ordinary people coming along and learning on this side. See, the first products are ready now. Tender patties, so nice. So bold, so golden, just like me. Stuffed with poppy seeds, apricot jam, cherries, strawberries, cabbage and potatoes. A while ago, I used to perceive it as a God's punishment. I had always hated though, and never liked to mess with that. The Lord humbled me down through, assigning me to this bakery. It was a very special sort of experience for me, you know. And then perhaps owing to the prayers of the Holy Fathers, a lady hurt me too. And we came to love each other. I love Doe, and Doe loves me. We play and speak to each other as equals, and when I happen to talk to Sarah Doe, it starts foaming as if it responds. Small prosperous have been sent to an oven, and the larger ones will follow shortly. Here is a big prosperer that will be used at a service. His beatitude will officiate with worshippers to perform liturgy, and this prosperer will be used at the Eucharist, where the clergy will be blessed alone with lay worshippers. A seal is pressed atop the prosperer. This one is a seal of Christ depicting angels and an inscription Nika, that is, the winner, symbolizing the Savior's victory over death on a holy cross. A monk's meal usually follows the morning prayer. There are only two meals a day at the monastery, at noon and at 8 p.m. The diet is truly unsophisticated. Today's menu, for instance, includes vegetable soup, potatoes, pickles, baked pumpkin and dessert, dried fruit drink with a bun. Brethren only eat fish and dairy products on holidays. They spend the most of 15 minutes for their meal, eating it in silent listening to the lives of the saints. Soon the bell will ring to signal the meal ending. Legend has it that in the 11th century, when more and more new novitiates started to arrive at the monastery founded by St. Antonius, the saint chose another seclusion place for himself. This is how the Mir Caves, or Antonius Caves, came into being. They still hold the relics of the Reverend, 
though accesses to them are barred. The founder of Kiev Pichersklovra is said to ban the finding by monks of his incorruptible body. When his last hour came about, Saint Antonius entered a niche in a cave and the earth crown collapsed behind him. The near caves consist of three avenues interconnected with passages. The main avenue is Pichersk, adjoining it is the Church of the Presentation of the Blessed Virgin. The total length of the underground corridors is almost 400 meters. Its width is a meter and a half and height two and a half meters. The catacombs hold the relics of 73 saints. One of them is Nestor, to whom we owe our knowledge of the history of Kiev Rus. This is the chronicle of the ancient times that gave rise to the Russian land. These words Nestor wrote in the dark catacombs of Lavra. The monk devoted all of his life to creating this opus describing the details of baptizing Princess Olga in Constantinople and the historic choice made by Prince Vladimir baptizing Rus. The Lord chose Saint Nestor to serve as a tool in his providence and caused him to collect all the stories told in Kiev Rus in that time. May we leave this invaluable legacy of stories about the history of Kiev State to future generations. Regrettably, Nestor did not write a single word about his own life. The scarce bits of available information reveal that he passed away in 1114 at a very hoary age. The Lavra legends have been validated and confirmed by scientists. Sergei Nikitin, a forensic expert from Moscow, used to work here as part of a multitask research team. He was charged with a unique effort to reproduce the faces of the monastery's first saints, including Nestor, Agapith the Healer, and Ilya of Murom. Speaking about the relics of Saint Nestor, one should mention that his skeleton is not complete. Fortunately, a skull with a lower jaw remained intact. Any effort towards appearance reproduction starts with anthropological research. St. Nestor's skull immediately and undoubtedly led to a conclusion that it's a male skull. The man was obviously not tall, as the skull is quite small. The age is well above 80 years old. The monastery's accounts of Ilya of Muram also met with scientific endorsement. Ilya was the legendary strongman who had spent 30 years lying on his bed before he went on to commit his celebrated deeds. His biographers tell us that in his senior age, he took the monastic vows at Kiev Pichersk Lavra. When the monastery was assaulted by human hordes, he stood in its defense and was lethally wounded in his chest and he was buried right here in the caves. This is what Saint Ilya of Murom looked like. Here he sits with no armor, no helmet, no sword, leaning against his huge stick, obviously replaying the great battles of the past. What is especially peculiar is that he has very thick skull bones, as you can see. This is the thickness of his frontal bone and the occipital bone. As you can see, they are way thicker than, say, of an ordinary man. The research absolutely validated the legends about the strong man's extraordinary might and his vigorous body build. Saint Agapith is another reverend of Lavra. He joined the abode at the times of Antonius, healing people with the power of a prayer. This gift, however, he kept secret, discreetly speaking prayers over the herbs he then offered to the ailed. He even cured Prince Vladimir Monomak. The prince wanted to sign to visit him, but Agapith declined the invitation not to break the monk's vows, as the chronicles tell us. He said, if I visit the friends, I would have to visit anybody else. His vow was to never leave the monastery's limits. He was a healer for the people, but he himself suffered from many ailments. 
the chronicles tell us that his last three months before he died, he had been badly ill. Sergei Nikitin managed to establish what conditions the revenant suffered from. While examining his skull, in a carotid, I found a particle that has survived there. I brought it to a histological evaluation in Moscow, which determined that it was an atherosclerosis plaque, which means that he had problems with his blood vessels. Besides, he had vertebral fusion, which is also a visible pathology and a disease. Therefore, these conditions could have been reflected in accounts of those times. It took nine months to restore the appearance of the healer Agapeth. The complex research pursued by the Soviet scientists sought to prove that the saint's relics had been exposed to artificial mummification pretty similar to the process applied in ancient Egypt. The research ascertains the tissues of the mummified relics of Agapeth the healer do not contain any hardening agents like tannin, fructose and butyric acid. In other words, the researchers' team have proven that we are dealing with natural mummification which we can't explain in this time. Kiev Pichersk Lavra monks are reluctant to discuss scientific findings. They just know. When help is wanted for any intellectual endeavor, this help must be sought from Reverend Nestor. If the shrine is in danger, it is Ilya of Muram, whose defense needs to be sought. If a disease has crept upon one, Agape the healer will be there to help. Its chimes can be heard miles away and you can see it three days before you arrive in Kiev. This is what the 19th century pilgrims wrote about the great Lavra Belfry. At a time, this grandioso bell tower, 96 meters, 52 centimeters high, used to be Europe's tallest construction. Its foundation diameter is 28.8 meters, and the walls of the first tier are eight meters thick. Its erection required 5 million bricks and 20,000 tons of lime, while the dome plating consumed three and a half kilos of leaf gold. The whole story began 300 years ago. In early 18th century, the monastery went through another turmoil. A merciless fire, destroying almost all structures, swept the upper part of Lavra. Some of the few buildings that survived included the walls of the Assumption Cathedral and, to a certain extent, the Trinity Church. Most of the cells, the refectory and the print shop behind the Assumption Cathedral, all of those burned down all the way and had to be reconstructed. It is owing to this massive, focused reconstruction that we have this integrally styled architectural ensemble. It is the Ukrainian Baroque. Centering this ensemble is the great belfry of Lavra. Johann Schädel, a German architect of the world acclaim, dared to take up this magnificent project. Putting up a belfry, being the tallest not only in the Russian Empire, but also across the whole of Europe, was quite an ambitious idea. The architect made a rash promise that he would complete all the works in three years. In reality, the construction effort lasted for 14 years and ate out all the savings kept in the monastery vaults. Here is a unique document, a receipt signed by Schädel to certify that the accounts with him have been settled in full. It is dated December 1745, quote, accepted from Kiev Pichersk Lavra treasurer, Father Pavel, for the belfry construction works, the ultimate balance and due for a year that is for the period from September 1743 through September 1744. The said belfry was financed in the amount of 400 rubles by Kiev Pichersk Lavra treasury. In the bottom of this receipt, the architect wrote in German, 
our descendants will solemnly bow before you, the majestic creation of my imagination and energy. It was the last payment received by the architect. Eight years later, he died in Kiev in dire misery. Nevertheless, his name will be enshrined in history forever. For 18 years now, I have been regularly climbing up the great belfry of Lavra. In order to announce the service by a pale of bell, The total of 374 steps make the ascension to the top a serious challenge. In the summer, you suffer from intolerable heat, while in the winter, you're getting chilled to the bone. But when you make it to the very top, you're truly rewarded. The breathtaking panoramic view in combination with the bell chimes heal all your soul wounds. I'm grateful to the God, to Our Lady, and to all the lover saints for this opportunity. Quite frequently, we have been asked about what happiness is. Different people define happiness in different ways. But for me, here is what I call real happiness. Once Shadel pledged that the Belfry would withstand many storms the life brings along, and right he was. The tower survived in the God-defying times the war when Kiev Pichersk Lavra was being blasted with explosions. It was mined looking to demolish it, but thanks to the Reverend Fathers and Our Lady, it survived. November 3, 1941. 11.30 a.m. in Kiev. German footage covering the arrival in Kiev of Josef Tiso, the president of Slovakia, Germany's ally. Along with a group of Nazi generals, he is sightseeing in Kiev Pichersk Lovra. At 12.30 p.m., the delegation leaves the monastery. Two hours later, an explosion makes the whole city shudder. German photographers fix this moment on their snapshots. After smoke shredded away, everyone saw the Assumption Cathedral turn into ruins. During the Nuremberg trial, this incident was blamed on Nazi occupants on the grounds that it had been a way for them to conceal the embezzlement of the cathedral. Albert Speer, the Minister of Armament and War Production in Hitler's government, confirmed the statement. In his book Inside the Third Reich, Speer explains that the cathedral had been blown up on the order from Eric Koch, the Reich Commissioner for Ukraine. Modern historians, however, tend to suggest that the explosive had been planted by NKVD officers at an earlier time. Nazis either could not find it or were reluctant to clear the mine and chose to bless the cathedral. We are inside a small shrine, the temple of John the Precursor. The explosion occurring in 1941 was basically focused in the underground section of this temple. The explosion effects clearly suggest that the eye of the blast was exactly here. The delay detonation mine had been planted in advance, obviously as intention was to hide it well. The side altar of John the Precursor, along with the central part of the cathedral, collapsed completely. Only the right side altar of John the Evangelist survived. State authorities started to discuss the recovery of the Assumption Cathedral in the late 80s, but for about 15 years onwards, it never went any further. In 1985, I, along with my friend Father Mikhail, arrived here for holidays. I said that I would love to meet someone who would rebuild this holy shrine, the Assumption Cathedral. Nine years later, the Lord blessed me with becoming Father Superior of this sacred place. In 1994, monks served the first liturgy right on the ruins of the temple on occasion of the Assumption of the Holy Mother of God. At 9 a.m. exactly, 
a big flock of storks rose above Kiev Pitcher's clover and went on circulating in a big eight. Not a single feather dropped, not a bit of dirt. At once his beatitude said Sanctus Sanctarum, proclaiming the liturgy ending and moving on to the blessing, the birds flew away. I was full of inspiration and confidence that the God will not abandon us as long as birds are bringing us the good news and pray with us. This celestial generosity and kindness gave us inspiration and force to build the Assumption Cathedral. On that very day, Father Superior Pavel received a blessing from his beatitude Vladimir, the primate of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, to launch the Assumption Cathedral reconstruction effort. Multiple letters were mailed to a variety of state agencies, and one of them was ultimately answered. On December 9, 1995, a presidential edict resolving on the Assumption Cathedral reconstruction was issued. The builders and restoration artists were faced with a serious challenge to reproduce each and every minute detail of the blasted temple, preserving the surviving fragments of the original walls. All the bricks in the ruins were carefully collected to then insert them back in the walls of the newly rising church. Human remains from ancient burials were occasionally found during this effort. The temple was known to be the final resting place for ancient nobility, and relics of Reverend Theodosius are said to rest in it as well. Human remains were placed in a specially designated part of the wall. This was Ekimantroi Joseph. Eventually, all the relics were buried in a basement of the side altar of John the Precursor. On November 21, 1998, the first brick and a capsule containing a message to future generations were laid in the foundation of the Assumption Cathedral. The temple was erected with an incredibly short timeline, as quickly as in just two years. Sunday, the refectory church is full of people. His beatitude is laid in the service. Whether or not the builders are at work, I'm not sure. Now here, a hundred meter tall crane collapses off its wheels and starts falling right towards the refectory church. If it had fallen down on the church, we would have ended up with at least 5,000 dead, as the structure would have been ruined at once. Everyone would have said that it was a retribution to the sinners sent by the God. Anyway, at some point the crane's downfall stops, and then it starts to slowly level up. It is yet another example of miracles that do and will occur in Lavra till the end of times. The central part of the great church was decorated with paintings and a 23-meter tall iconostasis. In October 1999, the main cross was mounted on the dome of the Assumption Cathedral. The wind was just furious, and topping the domes with crosses seemed impracticable. I said to his beatitude, the God will lend his help now. As soon as the cross touches the right opening, the wind calms down, and his beatitude says, your faith, my blessing. And indeed, the moment the cross goes in the opening it has to fit in, the wind is gone. According to the legend, in the 11th century, the Holy Mother of God said to the 12 Greek architects, my will is to live in the city of Kiev and for you to build a holy church in my name. The Greeks answered a higher calling and took the monastic vows afterwards. Their relics rest in the near caves up until today. I praise the Lord for his generous gift to this page in our history and for this opportunity of creation, for making us the creators of our history. First, St. Antonius was living here all alone. Then he was joined by the best sons of our nation, 
who wanted to give the best of themselves to serving their people. This is how this holy shrine came into being, which marks the 30th anniversary of its resurrection from ashes and from non-entity today. It is exactly Lavra, which is the reason why Kiev became what it became and where it became. This is the great gift given by Lavra. It is a prayer, a spiritual support to the people. It is a reminder that all of us are just wanderers in this world, and our final destination is not here. It is in heaven where the Lord awaits us. This is exactly the message that Lavra is sent in. The services in Lavra have always been very special to me. First, I have always sensed this great bonding with a thousand-year-old history. I have always appreciated what a special place it is for performing a liturgy, the place where the Orthodox faith has started to shine for entire roots in Kiev, the mother of Russian cities in Kiev, Petrovsk, Lavra, on the banks of the Dnieper. Metropolitan Pavel is giving final instructions. Archimandrite Polycarp is helping the photographer to position brethren in front of the camera. Here is Ioniki, who is recently taking his vows. Father Damien, the keeper of far caves. Father Jeremy, keeper of the near caves. The spiritual father, the elder of Rami, is in the most honorable spot. The monastery photographer, Hiram Monk Simon, is configuring the frame and rushes to take his place. The picture must capture them all. This is a unique case when all of the 210 brethren have left their responsibilities behind and gathered for a group photo. The square in front of the Assumption Cathedral concentrates the whole of a thousand-year-old history of Rus monkhood. Whatever happened to Lavra has always reflected the life story of the people. The chronicle of the monastery has seen it all. Numerous attempts of destruction, raids and assaults, plundering, putting on fire, demolitions, ousting and killings of the monks, even its seizures from the Orthodox Church. However, the God once said to his disciples that the Church of Christ will never be defeated by gates of the Inferno. The Lavra brethren are sure that this divine soil is under the special protection of its stern fathers, the reverend saints of Pucherist, and under the protection veil of the Holy Mother of God.